Welcome into the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Welcome to the Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. I am Joe Cardosi, joined by the party rockin' Jim Eichenhofer, uh, because we are partying today. We are continuing our series of player podcasts, sort of wrapping up the season. Uh, we will be talking about Mr. Jonas Valanciunas, the big man, the big Lithuanian today. Uh, and it's going to be a fun one because, you know, Jonas is one of those underappreciated players. If you if you check Twitter sometimes, Jim, which I don't suggest, uh, you, you'll see a lot of slander sometimes uh, at Jonas. But then when he is featured in the offense some games, you see, oh, those same people kind of love Jonas sometimes. Uh, he is misunderstood, I believe. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with him is that you have to make sure that you take advantage of the strengths that he has, which as you mentioned was you know if you can run the offense through him you can use him as kind of a focal point an anchor of what you're doing on the offensive end you can definitely get a lot out of his strengths I mean he had a great close to the regular season where he was I mean he's always getting you double doubles but I mean he had a bunch of games at the end where he had a double double by halftime yeah you yawned at it right oh yeah another Jonas double double who cares he was making just a big impact and a big imprint on games on a regular basis and I think a lot of that was because they just made the conscious decision to make sure that they ran some plays at the beginning of the game through yeah. him. It's easy when you have the offensive firepower that the Pelicans have, even when there's some guys out, to f- kind of forget, like, hey, we have this seven-foot guy in the paint that <laughs> yes. can dominate and back people down. Physical, yeah. Score you know, on some of these like five-foot hooks where it's like he's guarded by guys that just aren't big enough to do anything to yeah. stop him. So, I mean, that part of it was very valuable. But I think the other thing, too, was – um, as I noted in the article that recap that I wrote about him, he's the only player on the team that played plug, plug. <laughs> <laughs> played seventy plus games the last two seasons. So I yeah. mean, he's been just so reliable from uh, the standpoint of that you know he's going to be on the floor. Yeah, and he and he played through a lot this season. I mean, really that's the did. thing. He really was struggling sometimes. He was he was nicked up pretty much all season long and continued to play. And he also played. So he ended up with seventy nine games this year. He only, he played in every back to back both halves except for one time he he missed one half of a back to back. So I mean he there was a bunch of situations I'm sure where he was banged up and he could have said like, hey I need a game off or maybe the team was telling him like hey you know you, you should think about if you're worn out that you should take this night off and he never did. So I mean he I think he said he wanted to play in 82 games that was his goal. Um, and he's come close to doing that a few times in his career. Mm-hmm. He, he played 80 plus games three times in three separate seasons for Toronto. So, I mean, wow. it's something that he's done since the day that he walked into the league. You know, maybe that's why uh, Jonas and Herb Jones are great fishing partners. They just love to get in there and do the work. Uh, a big proponent of uh, Jonas getting fed the ball was our previous guest, Mr. Antonio Daniels, who used to say it all the time on mm-hmm. the Bally's broadcast. Yep. And, you know, as, as as much as we like to joke around, but like, hey, maybe, maybe Willie Green hurt him, you did start to see Jonas uh, featured a bit more down the stretch. And like you said, the double-doubles just kept piling up. And you see a lot of these teams sort of going small ball center and whatnot. And you realize having a legitimate big is effective and useful. It really is, and, it, and it, it's something that you can use to counteract some of these other teams that feel like they can just go with small lineups and get away with it. I love the fact that the Pelicans were in a position a lot of times where – they made the other team adjust to them because Jonas was so dominant and doing so much damage. Yep. So it seems like really I, I'm going to just pick a number out of the air. It seems like 90% of the time teams are trying to downsize when they adjust. Yeah. So it's it was good to see that the Pelicans were at least were to some extent able to kind of counteract that trend across trend across the NBA. Yeah. And a lot of the reason for that was Jonas. Um, you're still going to have situations where you have to go to Larry Nance Jr. Right. And you know go small, go more athletic, but um, Jonas, like I said, was a was a huge factor in the Pelicans finishing the regular season pretty strong. Uh, Christian Clark, another big proponent of Jonas, and uh, excited to talk to him about what well, you know what we could see ahead for Jonas, what what we might see in terms of adjustments with Jonas in the lineup. So let's talk to Nola.com's Christian Clark. <laughs> Oh, joining us on the Pelicans podcast as if by magic. Once again, 
Uh, we had him on earlier in the week, and we just could not stay away from the man. Had to call Christian Clark once again uh, and talk about one of our favorite guys on the team, Mr. Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, I, we're just glad that you were able to join us once again, Christian. Hopefully you're not getting attacked by dogs uh, this time. Uh, just glad that you were able to join the Pelicans podcast. How are you doing? Well, guys, I was on the fence about doing this, but then you told me we we're going to talk about the big scientist. Yes. yes. There's no way I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Christian, I think when, when I was going through the list of, of people to kind of pair with each player, I thought of you immediately with Jonas Valanciunas because I know you've had a lot of funny exchanges with him. There was one in particular I remember where – I think if you can if you can refresh my memory, I think you guys were talking about steak maybe or or how much he could how much he could put away and and he and you said something to the effect of you know you look like you could eat a lot of that and he was like is that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell when Jonas is threatening you or being yes. funny. Yes, I'm not sure if you remember that exchange. Well, I was I was asking every Pelicans player what's your favorite restaurant in New Orleans for this this story we did and I asked JV. And he said, Doris Metropolitan. And I was like, what's your favorite thing on the menu? And he's like, different cut of steak every day. And I was like, "I look, you look like a guy who could put away a lot of steak. And he's like, is that a compliment or are you insulting me? And I was like, it's a compliment, mostly, mostly. <laughs> Even if it wasn't, uh, I feel like if a guy that looks like Jonas is saying, is that a compliment? I'm just going to say yes. Uh, Jonas has been a lot of fun to cover on the team. You know, it, it, it seems like we talk about uh, former players all the time that we miss and the players that were brought in that sort of made us not miss him so much. I loved Steven Adams, man. I loved his personality mm. and what he yeah. brought uh, to a press conference. But you know what? Jonas just has a little different uh, vibe to him, and he, and he sort of makes me not miss uh, Steven Adams so much. I mean, what are some of your favorite moments you've had covering him? I know he had a tough season. You know, he played through a lot of pain. Uh, he was playing, you know, hobbled a lot. But, you know, like we talked about with C.J. McCollum, he was out there. He was he was actually playing the games uh, despite being nicked up. You know, I mean, what did you take away from covering him this season? Well, I think if you're a fan and you watch the the pre and the post game pressers, you know, a lot of times he's pretty he's pretty serious in front of like when he knows the cameras are going to be on them. Like he'll put on like the the professional facade, and every once in a while he'll he'll let a joke crack. But if you get him about the cameras, it's pretty funny. He likes comedy a lot. He's a, a huge fan of the movie Borat. He likes to do a lot of Borat lines. Um, and, you know, I talked to him about that a little bit, and he's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm like, obsessed with Borat. I'm, a, I'm the number one Borat fan. Uh, it's been that way for a long time. So really funny dude, um, if, if you get to know him a little bit. It's funny just to hear him in his accent do the Borat <laughs> voices because, you know, so many, you know, American people do that all the time, yes. and it's, like, almost a part of their personality. It's just... It's just funny for him specifically. I do want to hear it. Jonas Duncan go my wife! while he's hanging on the rim, though. Just once, just once. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he's 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 really funny. I think he's maybe the most underrated sense of humor on the team because, like you said, it's not something that it's the people, stern brow the public you off. Yeah. sees too much. And even you know, he's pretty he he is a pretty serious guy. But I think one of the things that's intimidating about him too is you can't tell sometimes whether he's being serious or whether he's joking. <laughs> But like I think what Joe alluded to earlier too, you, you if if you're not sure, you better you better go with he's being serious. Yeah, he's seven you know. feet tall. I'm just joking. <laughs> In terms of him him on the court this year, though, it seemed like one of the bigger developments of the last month plus of the regular season was just the team kind of shifting its focus to making sure that the offense ran through him. I mean, what what did you think of um, the way that he played in the last month plus of the regular season and just the kind of the shift in strategy or offensive approach that the Pelicans had late in the year. Yeah, it was something I kind of noticed in that, that series against the Houston Rockets in Houston. They played them twice in three days in, in mid-March. Mm -hmm. um, and this was kind of coming off of that bad loss to the Los Angeles Lakers at home. You know, I think the Pelicans met a couple of times and talked about, hey, here are some things that need to change for us moving forward. And I think one of the things they talked about was we need to involve you know, Jonas in the offense a little bit more. Um, you know, while while Zion is out there, I, I can understand my you know, why he would take a step back. Um, you know, like him and Zion both they're gonna like to score, you know, in that paint, in that real estate around the rim. So I get that. But, you know, I think one of the things that I was a little confused about was when Zion went down in early January, 
why Jonas was not emphasized a little bit more. I mean, he had such a good first year at the Pelicans, um, and I, I think it took him, you know, like two and a half months to, to really find him again and, and involve him a little bit more in the offense. Um, and, you know, I thought it helped him out when they did, you know, especially with no, no Zion in the lineup. It was just a different wrinkle for them offensively. Um, and I thought he, he had some really nice games there in, in the final, like, month of the season. I mean, we talked about how Jonas is sort of a double-double machine. You almost uh, took it for granted how effective he was and, and just efficient. And, you know, in a lot of NBA lineups, there's so much emphasis on small ball and whatnot. And and just to have a legitimate big who's physical in the paint, especially with no Zion, it just seemed like it was massively important to this team. And it almost seemed like we had to refigure out how important the center position is sometimes in, in, tum- in terms of getting easy buckets. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of people have sort of slanderized Jonas, uh, you know, throughout the season. But, you know, when he is used effectively and when he is used to his strengths, uh, it just seems like he is a, a huge component uh, of this team. I mean, how would you like to see him utilized more going forward? I know we have a, you know, this season has been a bunch of what ifs and and when, you know, what what could have been. But, you know, Jonas is, is, is in the lineup. He's not a guy that you got to worry about missing a lot of games for the most part. So, what do you expect to see uh, from him, you know, going forward into next season? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, I, I just think that when Zion is out there and kind of controlling the offense, I think it's just natural that he's going to take a step back on offense. And, you know, that's okay. Like, Zion is, is so good. Yeah. Like, I can, I can understand why. But, you know, especially, like, like – I would, I would be post, I would definitely be making sure, like, I got him post up touches in the minutes he's on the floor without Zion. Like, I think that just makes the Pelicans a better offensive team. I think we saw that in the final months of the season. So, like, in the non Zion minutes when he's out there, I think you just need to be emphasizing him as, as a post up threat every once in a while. I'm not saying throw it to him on every single possession or anything like that, but like, there was a noticeable uptick in, in the last month, and I think it helped them. It, you know, I think Brandon Ingram was like fantastic those those last I don't know ten fifteen games or yeah. so. And I also think part of the Pelicans' offense looking better in that stretch finally without Zion was was involving JV more. On the defensive end of the court, I mean, it seems like we've seen this trend. It's like a gradual thing, and sometimes it seems like it accelerates a little bit more each season, but. Um, obviously the center position seems like it's been become more matchup dependent than any other position on the court in terms of, you know, teams are going small with different lineups. I mean, how do you see the the future um, or just that, that trend in terms of, you know, the Pelicans obviously this year with Larry Nance and Jonas, the minutes were almost evenly split. Whereas, you know, the season before that, I think Jonas, I mean, Larry Nance didn't play that many games because he was coming back from an injury. But it was a little bit more of a of a uh, of a difference in terms of your starter plays thirty ish minutes and then the backup plays you know eighteen to twenty. I mean, how how do you see that as far as just how that affects Jonas in the future? Yeah, I think that was one of the the major shifts we saw this season. You know, I think in fourth quarters and in, in clutch moments, the Pelicans coaching staff oftentimes looked for for Larry Nance Jr. as opposed to Jonas. Um, Larry played more minutes per game in the fourth quarter than JV. If you look at clutch minutes, Larry played more than him. You know, Jonas played the most clutch minutes on on the Pelicans roster in 2021-2022, and he played the ninth most um, this past season. So I think took a, took a step back in terms of how, um, how he was used and how often he was used during clutch time. And I, I just think the Pelicans coaching staff showed us that they prioritized defensive versatility at the, at the end of games. Like they wanted the option to be able to switch. Um, they would give up some something in rebounding with that, but but they just wanted to have that that option to be able to switch and and not just play drop in the pick and roll. Um, and you know, I think there was honestly there was some good with that. I mean, I think that was like Larry was a big part of a reason why the Pelicans finished sixth in defensive efficiency tied for the best ranking ever in that category in mm-hmm. franchise history. Um, you know, at the same time, like it's not all positives. I, I yeah. think JV is far and away the best rebounder in their team and they really struggle to, to rebound a boat. Um, you know, especially on the defensive end when he's not in there. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a major trend we saw this year. 
Yeah, I mean, you said it. You're you're talking a lot of times about trade offs that you know you might be able to do to perform better in one area, but you're going to have to give up something somewhere else, and that that's kind of the back and forth and some of the challenges that every coaching staff has across the league. But I mean, is it the kind of thing? I mean, is is there any going back from the trend that is happening in terms of? It just seems like the NBA is continually more suited towards you know, like the, the six, eight, six, nine athletic center. It seems like, I mean, not that long ago we had Roy Hibberts of the world that were considered among the best centers in the league. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, the guy's not even in, in the, on a roster anymore. I mean, do you feel like that's just kind of the direction that things are headed as far as lineups and, and the kind of just the way that, that um, teams roll out lineups, not even just at the end of games, but just overall. Yeah, I think a lot of the times, but I don't think it, it necessarily has to be that way. Um, I, I mean, like Brooke Lopez, you know, he's been one of the best defensive players in basketball. He's like a, a true seven footer. Mm-hmm. You know, he's such a such a talented defender. So I, I just think there are, you know, some really big guys like who have that, that traditional center height who are so talented as defensive players that you could roll with them. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I think it, we're only going to see more of like the Larry Nance Jr. types and, and teams kind of trying to mimic what the Golden State Warriors have been able to do with with Draymond Green. Um, but I don't, yeah, it just it just I guess depends on the player, and it, it's kind of interesting. Like when you look at what bigs the teams that make it to the conference finals and, and make it to the championship have. Um, I mean, I think like the Sixers and the Nuggets could can obviously do it, you know, in part because those two guys are so talented on defense, but it's like, it's Al Horford with the Celtics, right? It's yeah. kind of Brooke Lopez. They have Giannis to help protect the rim too. Um, you know, DeAndre Ayton. I mean, I, I do think that like good bigs are still really important in today's NBA. Yeah, and I think a huge part of what Jonas brings to the game is <laughs> uh, consistency. You you know what he's bringing to the court every night. You know the value of what it is, and you know he's going to be on the court. Uh, Christian, thanks so much for joining us, talking some Jonas today. I'm hoping you get to join maybe Jonas and Herb on a fishing trip sometime, you know, maybe crack some jokes and uh, unfurrow that brow of his in the offseason. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Oh, big thanks to Mr. Christian Clark, friend of the pod, always reliable, hopping on with us, uh, as is Mr. Jonas Valanciunas, the subject we talked about. Uh, excited to see more of the big man, the Lithuanian in the offseason, more fishing picks and whatnot. Maybe I'll find out the beard balm secrets. I don't know, Jim. Uh, but uh, we will be talking more and more players. The uh, Tomorrow we'll be talking to the Graph about Mr. Herb Jones. Uh, And he is a big Herb Jones fan, as you know. He's a big Jonas fan as well. I'm sure he's a little sad he couldn't get on on this one. Uh, But we will be talking Herb Jones with Graf tomorrow, and do not miss it. Thank you for listening to the Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. I am Joe Cardosi. That is Jim Eichenhofer. And until then, go Bill. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. Join us three times per week on pelicans.com the Pelicans mobile app, or you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek.